Hello and welcome to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm your host, Zachary Elwood. If you didn't already know, I'm the author of a trilogy of books about reading poker tells and behavior, and I also have a video series. You can learn more about me and my content at readingpokertells.com. If you want to learn more about this podcast, check out my blog at readingpokertells.video slash blog. That's where I have descriptions and links for all the episodes. If you like this podcast, please give it a rating or review on iTunes or whatever platform you listen on. This episode's interview is from March 20th, 2020. I interview one of the most skilled and well-known rock, paper, scissors players in the world, Jason Simmons, a.k.a. Master Roshanbola. Jason has been interviewed by Rolling Stone Magazine and National Public Radio about the competitive rock, paper, scissors scene. Rock, paper, scissors is a very simple game. To many people, its simplicity probably makes it seem boring and random, with skill not playing much of a role. But many seemingly simple games can have a hidden depth, with factors you only notice after playing a lot and taking it seriously. Poker is more obviously complex than rock, paper, scissors, but some of the same concepts apply. Many new poker players just don't see how complex a game poker is, and they might lose a lot of money before finally realizing it's not as simple as they first assumed. In our interview, I talked to Jason about some of the edges that serious RPS players have found, with a special focus on reading behavior and influencing opponents. Before I play the interview, it'd be good for you to understand that the RPS scene is a bit over-the-top and comical and tongue-in-cheek. To show you what I mean, I'll read a few paragraphs from an article by Alex Mayasi, found on the site Priceonomics.com. The culture is so tongue-in-cheek that it's dangerous to take anything in the RPS world at face value. The best example of this is The Trio of Hands, a book by Wojek Smalsowa, which is supposedly the defining book about RPS. Neither the man nor the book, however, seem to exist. Yet when credulous newcomers ask about the book, insiders assure them that The Trio of Hands does exist, and it is a delightful tome of RPS wisdom or that Smalsoa is a Lao Tzu-like figure who wrote poetically and, quote, had already attained a level of greatness by the late 50s, end quote, even though no organized RPS competitions existed at that time. Similarly, Pete Lovering, who won the first RPS tournament in Toronto in 2002, did so while wearing a bathrobe with the words 1974 World Champion taped on the back. Large RPS tournaments are full of competitors with ridiculous costumes and nicknames, which Brad Fox describes as, quote, equal parts spectacle and strategy, end quote. Master Roshan Bola adds that many players adopt competition names just like in any sport, but he describes his persona, Master Roshan Bola, as a, quote, satire of the self-satisfied, self-promoting, egotistical sports rock star, end quote. And that's the end of the article excerpt. I confess I didn't know much about this aspect of the rock, paper, scissors scene before doing this interview. You might notice I'm probably a bit too credulous and sincere in the early parts of the conversation. Jason does give what I think are some very interesting and cool tips about reading and manipulating people. But at the same time, you might want to use some judgment to separate the practically useful information from the spots where Jason's maybe being a little over the top. In other words, you should be skeptical of Master Roshan Bola in this interview, just like you would if you were getting ready to play him at Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's smart to watch out for tricks. Hey, Jason. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Zach. Thanks for having me. Greatly appreciated. Much appreciated. This this will be an interesting one. So can you talk a little bit about your past, your, your championships you've won in the rock, paper, scissors area? Sure. Well, um, from an early age, um, I displayed a high level of mastery in rock, paper, scissors. I was kind of considered the, uh, the Bobby Fischer uh, of rock, paper, scissors, if you will. I was regularly beating players who were you know, two to three times my, old, my own age as a child. And uh, from there, I took a lot of that natural ability, uh, worked through with a lot of training. Uh, I played probably more matches of rock, paper, scissors than anyone currently on the planet. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of that gave me a little bit of initial credence. Um, I actually hosted the first ever rock, paper, scissors tournament, which was the uh, Burning Man Open in 2002. The most recent tournament that I won was a, a kind of a professional only invitational tournament in, uh, in Philadelphia. But early on in the sport, um, I announced my retirement uh, before sort of the modern era 
of world championships began in order to focus on um, a career in broadcasting for the sport. Uh, there was a definite conflict of interest. You know, you can't be providing the color commentary in a tournament that you're competing in. And several of the, the main tournament organizers at the time had asked me to stand down, saying that if I was playing in the tournament, they were worried nobody else was going to show up. Uh, so for the good of the sport, as well as to focus on, you know, again, a career broadcasting, uh, I, I did announce my retirement. But that's only really been from um, from tournament competition. I still do private matches, still do personal matches. And, uh, you know, of course, when you're spending time with other rock, paper, scissors professionals, uh, invariably, you're going to throw hands. <laughs> so uh, where is the world championship held? Um, the world championships uh, are currently on hiatus, uh, but uh, the, they had been held in, uh, in Toronto, uh, Canada, uh, for, for all, the better part of a decade. Uh, and again, there is a current hiatus. Uh, I, I suspect that there are some things going on in that front. But really, the, uh, there's been a great uh, diaspora of, of rock, paper, scissors tournament play. You can find uh, every, every small town has had at least one rock, paper, scissors tournament, and you assume that the, the bigger towns and bigger cities have had you know, bigger and better ones. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot going on, but really the, the people who want to organize the sport have, you know, are continuing to organize and you, you can, it's, it's not too hard to find a match in any city. So, and worth mentioning, you've been interviewed by Rolling Stone. You've been interviewed, interviewed by NPR, uh, and some other media outlets. So yeah, you've gotten, you've gotten some good press co coverage there. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that, that was one of the things, uh, too, is when, when I first started competing, you're competing at the world championship level. Uh, because I was a known player, you know, I'd written the, the forward for the official strategy guide, uh, you know, things like that. I was kind of a natural go-to when it came uh, to getting these player interviews. And at, at the high levels of the sport, like so many times I would get interviewed by, like, like let's say I was going to play a tournament in Chicago. The local Chicago news would interview me, uh, as, as well as some, many of the other top players. And at, at a certain point in that level, the, the interviews – Kind of take on um, the function of a pre-game. So, let's say if I'm wanting to, if I'm going into a tournament and um, let's say I'm wanting to try and get my the other players to open with rock, you know, I'll go in and say, you know, hey, hey, rock is really the best, you know, thing to, to open with. Uh, you know, so I'll go into to the interviews like that. So a lot of times uh -huh. the information that you're getting, you're putting out there in interviews, you know, after a while, uh, it is to you know hopefully control or at least influence your opponents in the course of a match. Uh, ultimately, I found that where I'll be playing someone in the same stance, I'll throw a losing throw, and then I'll change my stance. They assume that I'm going to switch it up, but I throw the same that losing throw a second time, and you know, nine times out of ten, I turn that losing throw into a winning one just just by changing my stance to try and, to get them to think I'm changing everything else too. Mm. Talk quickly about, if you could, about the structure of the when you play the the tournaments and and, and competitions. Is it like you know, a bunch of short ones, best out of three, or how exactly exactly does that work? Sure. Well, different tournaments have different formats, uh, and there are different sort of like different parts of the world, different cultures uh, approach the rock paper scissors game very differently. So, if you're a professional player, uh, of course, you adopt uh, whatever the local standards are. Uh, generally speaking, most of the tournaments that I've seen uh, throw on four, so it's one, two, three, shoot. Uh, for a very specific time uh, on the West Coast, specifically in California, more of a one-two shoot was favored. Um, there are some places I've played in Hong Kong before, for instance, where it was just one throw in and out. There was no even priming convention. So you got to get the, you know, and the World Rock, Paper, Scissors Society uh, as a whole really works to standardize the approach. At the very least, figure out how you play before you start playing. That, that's mm -hmm. usually good advice. And it shows it shows class. You know, no one wants to go into a city you've never been before and start saying, okay, we're doing a race to five, we're throwing on four when everybody else does a race to three. Um, but when you look at big tournaments like uh, the World Championships in Toronto, um, typically they would do a best two out of three throws wins a set, best two out of three sets wins a match. Um, that, that kind of was adopted as the standard tournament format for many years. The Minneapolis Hustlers, who are uh, a very well-known crew of rock, paper, scissors players, uh, started promoting what they called hustler style, which is a race to 10. First player to win 10 throws wins the match. 
um, almost overnight, all the top players started playing this format. Uh, most recently, I played a match against professional uh, poker player Perry Friedman. Uh, we played a couple of race to tens for uh, the ESPN coverage of the Moxie games, which we can uh, discuss a little later. But amongst most professionals these days, a lot of them seem to prefer the half hustle, which is a race to five. First player who wins five wins the match. It's long enough. You can get some interesting long-term strategies, but it's still it's friendly for television. You know, you're not going to sit there and watch five minutes of a race to ten match. So. Let's talk a little bit about throwing specific uh, throws. Most people know that uh, rock is the most commonly thrown one, right? Is that pretty commonly known? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's commonly known. And, um, you know, against certain players, um, that's that's going to be the case. But uh, I, I'll, I'll go so far as to say that that's not as much of a truism as it was, say, even 10 years ago. You know, and, and again, a lot of it was uh, that certain players uh, you know, were, were putting out there, even certain organizers putting out that rock was the most popular throw. So then, of course, if you'd, if you'd seen that interview... Right. It was the difference. I guess there's, there's a lot of difference between playing an amateur you know, player, somebody who doesn't take it seriously, versus playing somebody at a, at a tournament. Well, well, that's true as well. But at the same time, um, you know, there's the, the first ever world championship, uh, the eventual, uh, eventual winner, Master Pete Lovering, one of the, the greatest players of all time, uh, won the t- whole tournament with rock. It was known as the rock herd around the world. <laughs> and uh, and it was really a statement when for uh, especially for a player like him who favors a very Zen approach. You know, he's he's not playing versus his opponent. He's playing with his opponent. And the game becomes um, greater than the two of them combined. At least that's what he tells his uh, his paying students. <laughs> uh, but in, in any case, uh, sure. You know, rock. A lot of times when people say, oh, rock's the most common throw, and they say, okay, well, what makes you say that? It's like, oh, well, there's a study that we did online. We took you know, a sample of 100 players. These are always small samples, and in some cases, mm-hmm. just the very way that the information is put out there, if you click on a button and rock is the far left option, a lot of people might just click on that because that's where that's where the browsers are in the first place. So it's right. it's more of how the information is picked up more so than anything else. But, but you will notice, like, I think a lot of times... Um, at certain events that uh, that would sell beer or alcohol, a lot of times the, the more intoxicated a player is, the more likely they are to throw a rock. I've definitely noticed mm. that. You know, a lot of times if someone is clenching their fist really tight before the match, I'll notice that they'll go with rock. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times if your opponent, and, and this, this is just a weird observation on my end, if a, a player looks happy, like if they look just really, really happy, especially when they're losing, odds are they're going to they're gonna throw rock. Uh, hmm. there, there's just something about that happy-go-lucky mindset that just makes them out. You know, screw it. I'll just throw the rock out there and let my cards, let the cards fall where they may. You know. It was kind of interesting when I did a, I did a Twitter poll. It got 500 entries, and it's, and I asked people, ask someone you're with to do rock paper scissors and report what they threw first. Like 60% said that the other person threw rock, which I thought was, you know, obviously way high. That's like much higher than, you know, I, I, I've seen on the. Uh, you know, the studies online and stuff. But I thought that was interesting. Like, and that, and that's a really, obviously a really amateur uh, response too, because they were probably just asking whoever they were with at the time, you know? So I thought that was, uh, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, no doubt. And, um, you know, again, there's always things you can look at on studies like this and say, okay, well, did they figure out if they were throwing on three or four? And if the person accidentally threw on three, was that counted as a rock accidentally? Mm. Uh, things like that. I, I think you showed a, a good format by asking, uh, an associate of whoever you ask, because otherwise I would say, you know, if, if they were all, you know, professional or amateur poker players, you know, they might be more inclined to throw paper first uh, yeah, for, for any up. variety of reasons. It's an interesting format. But again, uh, if, if if you're dealing with amateur players and professional players, you know, once the professional players get in and start pushing people around, you know, influencing people to, to make certain throws over others, that can definitely throw those numbers um completely out the window. Uh, mm-hmm. But again, as most professional players that I know are totally happy maintaining the belief that rock is the most popular throw because it kind of gives us gives us an easy ground to, to it starts the playground kind of tilted in our favor. There was an old uh, quote unquote truism in the sport where you would see some of the like tournament organizers early on say, well, you know, men tend to open with rock and women tend to open with scissors, et cetera. And it was just complete nonsense. Uh, everybody just mm-hmm. you know kind of believed it and took off with it. But it's saying, you know, okay, if you're arbitrarily splitting the gender world into only two options, but you have a game that has three options, I mean, what does that tell you about the validity of it as a as a potential strategy? Uh, uh-huh. And you know, ultimately, I think um, you know, looking at gender differences when it comes to making the throws is a complete dead end when it comes to 
reading or influencing as as professional play. It's a it's, it's a dead strategy. It's just the you know people thought it was good copy for a while, and it really isn't. Yeah, not not to beat this horse too much, but I was thinking of the 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 various factors which might make it more likely for people to to throw rock. And then I had a few, and you've probably thought about this before, but I was thinking you you know they've talked about the toughness, the male factor. Uh, they talked about the fact that your hand is already in that rock position when you throw. They've talked about, in, in the name, rock, paper, scissors, rock is the first one, so people are probably more inclined to think of that first. Do you right. think that's an accurate like, synopsis of you know, what the, yeah. the factors that lead people in that direction? For sure. Uh, and you know, I think that's, that is a big part of it. And those, those are all things that, that can, can definitely factor in. But I would, I would say that you know, none of those reads are going to be against 100% of all people. But right. if you find someone who falls into, starts falling into some of those multiple categories, it's like, okay, this person, you know, is, you know, they, they, they look a little aggressive. They're, they're sort of, all their muscles are sort of tensing up. They're clenching their fists. You know, you, you, you can look at that person and read most of the time if they're going to, if they're going to throw rock or not. And, and especially if you start saying them, to them things like, oh, I bet you're going to throw rock next time. Mm -hmm. or even if you look at someone like that and you tell them, hey, I'm going to throw rock this time. It doesn't matter who you tell them is throwing the rock, you, you've mentioned the word rock a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's taking, let's say if you put somebody on about a 50% shot of playing rock, you're, you know, that's already pretty good. But if by mentioning that you can even make them 10% more likely to play, all of a sudden you're more likely to win than you are to lose. And, uh, right. you know, but, just... but again, yeah, even the rock players aren't going to play the same thing twice in a row that often. Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't see a whole lot of, rock heads as we used to call them going rock 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 doing what we used to call the avalanche which is uh, three <laughs> rocks in a row that's more of a professional move but you know if you you know if, if you bring on a player who loves to open with rock and they never repeat the same throw twice i'll play that player all day long <laughs> you know and then those are matches i'll win all day long i was playing with some people uh recently uh, played a few people in a row where they were more like academic intellectual types writers I won the short little contest by mostly throwing rock and it seemed like they were all throwing paper and scissors. And it kind of made me think there's probably some correlation with people that are more intellectual or academic to not throw the rock because the rock seems kind of obvious maybe to them. And they're like, Oh, I like, you know, the paper and the scissors seem kind of uh, academic, you know, in a, in a way I wondered if sure. you had any thoughts of that. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely uh, would agree with that. And I think uh, I, I seem to remember an NPR interview that I did with someone once where I mentioned how right. most, most of the journalists I've dealt with open with uh, with paper uh, just because of the old uh, newspaper uh, associations to that. So, sure, I've noticed that. And, um, you know, again, you can look at the three throws of rock, paper, scissors as being sort of graphic of different stages of the growth of, um, of humanity as a whole, if you will, you know, from the, the cavemen bashing rocks together, uh, you know, and then you move on to use of simple tools, which, you know, the scissors aren't simple tools, but, you know, it's still representative of that phase of humanity's uh, growth. And then, you know, paper, completely manufactured product, uh, you know, it taking the world around us and changing it to shape our needs. And these things are definitely shown, but, I, but I've, I, I hear what you're saying. There's uh, a lot of people who, who see the rock and, you know, the rock is shaped like a fist. And a lot of people, when they see that closed fist, it does remind them of aggression, uh, sort of a very simple, you know, simplistic sort of uh, bullying approach, if you will. And they don't want anything to do with it. So they go uh, paper or scissors. And you know, in your case, when you said you were at this party uh, in the small group, mostly throwing rock, mm -hmm. you know, had I been there, you know, I, I, I would have probably gone with a scissors heavy strategy myself, but sprinkled just enough rock in to keep the other players honest. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if everybody else is going scissors or paper, you know, if I'm going scissors, I'm going to go for the tie and I'm going to go for the win. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, you know, if there are other people like Zachary Elwood there that are going to be picking up on these tells, then I'll, I'll want to throw just enough rock in to keep them from getting a clear read, just enough to muddy the signal just a little bit. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, if they're throwing mostly scissors or, or paper, your best bet is to throw scissors. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And what you'll find, too, is that the very some of the higher levels of the sport, top players are not only experts at reading physical tells they're also experts in putting out fake tells uh mm -hmm. so i'm sure you see this in poker as well you know something and you have to build these up over time but you know let's say if uh you know you've been playing a lot of friendly matches and giving uh, one of those obvious uh, scissors tells like uh let's say an obvious scissor tell just as a sidebar is when you take your thumb you hold your, your thumb on top of the fist when you're getting ready to play if you drop your thumb down to cover the second and third finger 
you're going to be flicking those scissors out. That, and most people do that without even thinking about it. So that's a mm. good physical tell to read up on. But let's say if I've been doing that against another top player for, let's say, a year or two in friendly matches, you know, as soon as we've got an unfriendly match on the line, then I'm going to give them that dropped thumb, making them think I'm going to throw scissors. And, you know, at, at that point, I've got, you know, I know that they're going to throw rocks, so I'm going to throw paper. But, you know, really, you want to develop uh, a really straightforward, very honest sort of reputation uh so you can have that little bit of subterfuge there for when you for when you need it yeah the more the more you use types of false you know deceptions like that the less people will rely on your on your false deceptions or yeah in the way you want them to yeah exactly and and of course when you notice that happening that's the best time to go honest again say you're playing people another player that's you know top-notch world-class i would imagine like in poker where uh it's just very unlikely to have those kind of deceptions because you're both operating under, under the assumption that there's not going to be value to trying to find that information. So does it just revert in those situations to just trying to have a completely random selection in that case, you know, mm-hmm. assuming you're playing another top-notch player, or are you still looking for edges even against a top-notch player? Well, you're still looking for edges, uh, but your, your introduction to the topic of, of randomness is, um, is it's a very interesting subsection of rock, paper, scissors strategy. Because people always say, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just play random. Uh, and that, that's, you know, for some people, that's the answer to everything is, oh, I'll just play random. In the first place, human beings can only approximate randomness. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not random creatures. So let's say if you go in and you're getting ready to play someone and you're like, okay, I'm just going to throw random. And then you play the first throw that comes into your head. Uh, let's say if I'm, you know, if I'm doing that and I throw paper because it's the first throw that comes into my head. Now, did it just come into my head because I'm thinking randomly or did it come into head because a paid associate of my opponent is shuffling a stack of newspapers <laughs> just just on the right of my field of vision to influence me? You, know, you have to be aware that you can still be influenced in these things. So <laughs> when, when a lot of players uh, say that they're going to play randomly, what they do is they'll actually get a string of moves, let's say five to ten moves in a row, and memorize them. They'll, right. they'll go to a, a website, let's say random.org, and get a, a random set of throws, mm-hmm. and they'll have this random string memorized for, for use in play. Uh, there's some of the top players, like say, for instance, uh, C. Urbanus out of Philadelphia, who will go into a tournament with five or six random strings ready to go. And you never mm-hmm. know which one mm-hmm. he's going to be using at any given point. Now, the, the thing is, like, in theory, at least, you're not going to get much of an edge throwing randomly. Like, you're not going to all of a sudden come, you know, you're not going to take that one third percentage of winning throws and double it into a 60% of winning throws just by playing randomly. Uh, at the very least, if you're playing random, It's something that you do if you know you're going up against an opponent who's better than you and you're trying to take a little bit of the sting out of some of their strategies. So, you know, if you know someone Mm -hmm. is an expert at visual manipulation or reading, you say, okay, I'm just going to get my string. I'm going to go in random and that's going to be it. But at the same time, you're ignoring some of the possible edges that you could get to help you in. Like, let's say Mm -hmm. if I go into a tournament, a match with a random strings and I notice three throws in that every time my opponent throws paper, they release it way early uh, mm-hmm. or their elbow shoots out to the side and i noticed this tell and i know it's the real thing but it's like no i gotta stick to my my strategy i gotta stick to my my scripted random strategy you know you're going to be missing out on a lot of those advantages so when, when a lot of the top players do is they don't rely on random strategies exclusively but they will have say like two or three small random strings that they can uh just put into a longer match like let's say if i'm playing a race to 10 against someone I may decide at the mid game, just as a transition between throws four and six, I'll go with a string of random throws, almost like a palate cleanser before the the delicate aperitif that is my end game uh, comes into play. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you'll you'll have the random. But again, human beings can only approximate randomness. Uh, you know, we're we're not truly random, and so if you know, you can ig- ignore all the possible ways to become a better player at your own peril. Uh, ultimately, if you rely solely on nothing but random throws. It, it stunts your development as an overall player. You'll never be one of the greats that way. It's very much like poker in that way. I mean, it's a common discussion in, in the poker world and, and most uh, you know skill based games. You know, there's there's the game theory optimal approaches, which are you know the equivalent of of having a completely random uh, strategy. And it, game theory optimal is not completely known in poker, but there's it's known how to approach it for a lot of situations. So. Sure. But then, you know, people have the argument like you're leaving money on the table because you're not using that information that, that, that the weaknesses that people have, you know, that game theory optimal is only best when you're, you know, trying to play against someone who you think is very good. It's not a it's not a good solution for people that have a lot of weaknesses or even have a few weaknesses that you can find. Yeah. 
Exactly. And and what, what I find, too, is that you know, in going to these uh, tournaments, and I, I played in rock, paper, scissors tournaments and private matches all over the world, uh, all over the United States, uh, Vegas, East Coast, West Coast, uh, played in Australia, played in Hong Kong. And something that you find, you, you, you see a lot of the same people show up to these events, like the, the so-called rock, paper, scissors professionals all show up to these same events. And if there's somebody you know that you've played for a weekend, for five years in a row, you start to pick up you know not only tells but patterns, uh, specifics. You know the the way that a player's you know might start off the day strong and end the day weak every day. And again, you, you can't leave all that out, all that information out. Um, you know just because you you're have an addiction to throwing as randomly as possible, and it's and it's a lot more fun as you figure out these uh, these obvious tells and the way to read them and the, the way to manipulate you know people as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and and you find too in in looking at the the sorts of tells and uh, reading people, um, you know, there are definite categories. Uh, you know, there are sort of the physical tells that some people have, like as far as, you know, some players will throw their elbow out to the side before they go paper or do the, the, the thumb drop that I mentioned earlier. Some, pa- some people have um, pattern-based tells, which is, you know, like saying that no one's going to throw the same throw more than two or three times in a row. That's more of a pattern-based tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's also what I would call more spiritual tells uh, or um, occult tells, if you want to look at it that way. Like, let's say if I'm playing up against a player and I notice that uh, every single time they throw scissors, they have a sort of a blue aura around them. Uh, now, is that a real spiritual or occult manifestation? You know, most likely not. It's just a, a hallucination that my brain is creating to communicate information to me that that player is about to throw scissors. So, you know, if I start noticing that hallucination of a blue aura or something like that around someone a few times, I start paying attention to it. And if it starts working against more than one player, I incorporate it into my playbook. Hmm. So you think it's just your mind uh, giving you clues about something you know, but it's beneath the surface that you can't consciously know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and a lot of times, like, you can, you can develop those abilities as well. And uh, I, I do develop... Even though I'm retired from tournament competition, I still have a, a handful of, of students who uh, who I train and who I work with. And uh, again, you know, you the, about the first year of uh, my students' training is spent convincing them that these sort of occult properties exist, and then the whole second year is convincing them that it's all their brain hallucinating and making these things up to communicate information to them. And occasionally, you see a student get that breakthrough moment where they they realize that you know, for them maybe it smells, you know, and every time mm-hmm. they smell like you know, sort of a woodsy cedar smell for some reason, you know, paper's about to be thrown. And, and again, those aren't, you, know, you, you can't write a book about those tells because they're going to be different from person to person. But a lot of it is, it, it is going with the gut, but at the same time, realizing that like anything else, the gut can be fallible. And you've got to, you know, at the same time that you're learning to pick up on these extrasensory clues, you're also uh, trying to make sure that you, somebody's not getting their hustle over on you. Right. It kind of reminds me of when I talked to a an experienced state policeman not too long ago where he was telling me, I was asking about how did you know, what are some indicators you might know that somebody's up to no good on the highway and might pull somebody over for some, you know, or get it or get a sense that somebody's up to no good. And he said, usually he just had a vibe that he had before he even noticed any details about a car. He would just be like out of the corner of his eye, be like something wrong is here. And then he would, when he actually paid attention to it, he would, he would find details. But it, sometimes when you're really experiencing something, you get those vibes without knowing consciously what it is. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and in many cases, when people refer to uh, something they call intuition, you know, there, there's nothing metaphysical or paranormal or occult about it at all. It's, it's one handle to get on your brain, piecing together a lot of different information simultaneously, some of which you may be aware of and some of which you may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. And uh, a a large part of that comes with training and experience. Uh, So, you -hmm. know, the intuition of a top level player is going to be different because they played literally thousands of more games over the course of their life than an amateur player. So, of course, their intuition is going to be much more finely honed than than the the average player on the street. Let's talk a little bit about that NPR interview you had, because uh, that was an interesting one. I was listening to that. And so, Long story short, you and the NPR re- reporter, uh, I think it was Steve Vinsky, did a little, uh, you know, best out of three uh, rock, paper, scissors over the air, and you beat them. And uh, one thing you did, though, I almost didn't notice it because it was in, in the, uh, you know, what, what magicians call forcing or you call, you would call influencing or, or manipulation. Leading up to it, you mentioned how, oh, some people say uh, women tend to use scissors more, and you've noticed that reporters like to throw paper more, and it was very subtle but after I heard you guys play, I realized, oh, you were kind of forcing him away from using uh, using paper. 
I think you threw paper first and he threw rock and and you both threw that same way for the first two throws. And so you beat him like that. So I thought that was an interesting kind of, you know, influence in that direction. Well, for sure. And, and, and a lot of what that uh, takes, I was basically just starting with my standard belief, which is that most players aren't going to throw the same thing more than once and apply that specifically in this case. So that's why he, he lost with, with, with two throws in a row. Um, and now let's say, for instance, if instead of being a respected reporter for NPR, um, that Steve had been, let's say, a, a collegiate reporter working for the college newspaper who's just starting to earn his stripes, just starting to get involved and wants to do it as a career. If I'd said something like, yeah, I noticed most, most journalists open with paper, most likely Steve would have opened with paper because he, you know, he wanted to, it was something that he wanted to be, you know, and mm-hmm. instead of something that, that he was. And when I, when I told him, you know, uh, oh, most reporters, you know, will do this, uh, you know, in, in his own way, he, he was going around the circle. He, he rejected it twice, right. uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. which, uh, that's, you know, again, that's one thing in rock, paper, scissors, since it's a circular play, you know, it's not like people are reacting to your reaction, to your reaction, to their reaction. You know, you can only go so many spots levels. around the circle before yeah. you're back yeah. where you started, yeah. <laughs> right. in other words. So it doesn't necessarily make it any easier, but it does make it uh, a little a little more classic, a little a little more simple. I mean, people scoff at rock paper scissors as a as a child's game, but you know if you look our our government in the United States is based on a rock paper scissors like relationship between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial mm. you know, branches. It, it's a rock paper scissors relationship, and in theory, rock paper scissors was created as a way to settle disputes that didn't favor anyone over a longer period of time. Because in right. theory, everyone is going to win and, and lose a third of their matches. But then, like any other sport, you know, like especially if you played poker or anything else, it's not random. And the best players will always find ways to to exploit that. I read uh, there were some studies about uh, or scientific papers about how that same kind of, you know, three way balance or, or more than three way, three way balance of, you know, this beats that and that beats that. And this the third thing beats the first thing that kind of balance was present in some you know, natural systems like between animal, animal competitions, you know, like for mating and, and stuff like sure. that. The systems uh, like to find these solutions where it's a more balanced approach. Well, I guess it, it's probably more the fact that to survive, they had to find a balanced approach, right? I guess it's like, in other words, this rock, paper, scissors dynamic plays a, a role in a lot of balanced systems. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, and I, I recently read a book, um, called uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Game Theory for Everyday Life uh, by Lynn Fisher that, that explored that a lot and explored sort of that, uh, that, that dynamic, uh, is, which, which is known as a, um, a, a non-transitive tripartite. So it means you know, mm. three parts, each of which beats one, ties itself, and loses to another. And you'll see it in uh, you know, bacterial populations. You'll see it in certain bird populations, et cetera. Um, you know, see it in situations where there are certain mating strategies that are used. Mm-hmm. Nature favors diversity in this case. And mm-hmm. if it were a situation where one would automatically win and, and, and dominate, then potentially the whole species would suffer. But because you have this right. non-transitive tripartite uh, scenario going on, further ad- adaptation and further development is possible, uh, mm-hmm. which, which is always favorable. So back to your NPR interview really quick. When you, I was curious, when you told him that reporters liked paper, was that a just made up to, to influence him or was that a real thing? You know, it's, it's one of those things that in rock, paper, scissors, we say, well, that's true, even if it's a lie. Um, <laughs> yeah. to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't think anyone had ever made that observation before. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it was more of an interesting line. I mean, no one has done more rock, paper, scissors related media interviews on the planet than, than me. And I say that, you know, without ego, uh, it's just a statement of fact. And, you know, the fact I've ever since mentioning it, I've had a pretty good run of being able to use that against various people who've worked in media. Uh, and again, no, no one works with actual physical paper anymore, obviously, or very, very few people work with physical paper. So, uh, you know, whether that's going to become an out, outdated tell is, you know, that's that's something that, that still remains to be seen. And mm-hmm. uh, I have to conduct a little more research into that you know, b- before I put it out there. But but for sure, I, mean, I think I think that was the first time I'd ever taken that strategy out in public. You know, after trying it once, it won once. So it's I'm not, I'm not ready to call it the next big thing in rock, paper, scissors strategy. But, you know, it worked for me once. So I'll probably try it again. So another thing you did in that uh, interview with with NPR was you said after the first throw, you said, let's see what else you've got mm. to, to the reporter. And that's uh, some sort of strategy to w- what's the implication there or what are you trying to do? Yeah, 100 uh, percent. So, you know, let's say and you can do this whether someone uh, either wins or loses uh, when you say to someone, so what else you got, you're verbally 
challenging them, uh, you're, you're throwing down the gauntlet to them uh, to influence them to, to say, you know what? Screw you. I'm not going to show you what else I got. I'm going to show you the <laughs> same throw again. And uh, you have to know the type of player you're playing against. But most people will resist what they see as an obvious attempt to, attempt to push them around. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so if you, if you ask someone what else you got, most of the time, or a lot of the time, we won't, we won't say most, but a lot of the time they're going to throw the same thing again just to show you that you know you can't tell them what to do and of course you know you're you're ready to go just like i was ready to go in that uh, that npr interview yeah you threw the same one again and you beat him again yeah yeah uh, exactly yeah it was really interesting because i thought your the way you did it was quite subtle like i didn't notice either of those things even though the the one about reporters throwing paper probably should have been apparent but uh you know that was but it's still it was it was very smooth like you threw it in along with other information and it just flowed by but i can see how these subtle uh influences work like even if they're unconscious for that person you know they're they can have an effect for sure sure and uh and a lot of that i find you can do this even before match starts and uh you know i'm not gonna put all my secrets out on the table but uh you know again something as simple as before a match if you're if you, you know if you're rubbing both your hands together kind of like you're trying to warm your hands up you're you're sort of making the physical sign of paper there's a certain percentage of people who are very visually oriented who will see you doing that and without even thinking about it They'll they'll throw paper on their first throw because you you've influenced them. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's some players, you know, while I've got my right hand down taking care of business, I'll do you know one two three shoot. In between two and three, I'll pull my left hand up just to show them the scissors. Uh, and a lot of times people will see the scissors and then throw it just because you you flashed it in front of their eyes. And I've had people get you know they're laughing but they're all they're almost angry. They're going you know what I was just going to throw paper until you showed me the scissors and then they're like, I didn't even, you know, I, I didn't even mean for my hand to do it. It just did it by, by <laughs> accident. And, uh, you know, so again, going back to the earlier comment on the, the random tells, that's the sort of thing you're, you're giving up on if, if you're just going purely random mm -hmm. is the ability to kind of, you know, push, push people around like that or influence people to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, other common or reliable tells. You've talked about a few, but are there any that stand out that you they haven't mentioned? And I, and I know, of course, you probably don't want to give away everything, but if, if there's anything you can give away in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're looking just at types of tells, uh, the first thing that anyone thinks is purely physical tells, um, which you know, a lot of that carries over from poker, whether you've got the person who you know tugs on their ear or scratches their eye if they're trying to bluff or something like that. And it's not always that simple, but but again, if you're looking for a straight up physical tell against someone that you're assuming is an amateur player, they're not trying to hustle you. If they're going to throw a rock a lot of times, we've mentioned earlier, if their hands, their fists are clenched, uh, if, they, if they're if they looking happy, even when they're losing, I've noticed. And, and a lot of times if the player looks like they're already on their way to celebrating before they even win. So if they're like, you know, one, two, yes, three, shoot, you know, a lot of times they're just going to end up throwing rock. Or a lot of people, if they get confused or if they get, um, let's say, if you've got a a friend with a megaphone who between throws two and three starts sh shouting out <laughs> random unrelated information from like half a block away. And you notice the person paying attention to that. They're going to just stick with rock because they're not even thinking about throwing anything. That's, that's more, that's, that's less of a reading thing, but it is something you can do. Is that more yeah, of like, do you think that's just because it's like rock is kind of the path of least resistance. It's just the first thing people think of. Yeah. It's the only throw that's preformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's the only throw that, 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 that you start off in that position. So <laughs> Paper is one of the throws that has the, the most obvious tells, partly because it's the only throw that requires a 90-degree wrist rotation. Mm. Uh, rock, you throw with thumb on top, pinky on the bottom. Scissors is thumb on top, pinky on the bottom. Uh, but when you're throwing paper, you rotate it 90 degrees, so your, your thumb and pinky are pointing to the sides. So um, two tells that I've noticed, uh, one from myself, and I don't have this tell anymore, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be putting it out there. Uh, when I made that rotation, I would lead with my elbow. And uh, you can kind of do this on your own, or for those of you listening at home, you can try this. You know, as you turn your left hand over, invariably your right elbow kind of wants to shoot out a little bit just to. Oh, just yeah, to I can feel that. that move. Right. Yeah. And so, me personally, and a lot of other players too, they'll lead with the elbow. So, before they even you know, start doing anything with the fingers, the elbow is already starting to point out to the side. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of work for me personally to get past that throw. Uh, another friend of mine, and this this is just a coincidence, but she works as a, uh, a zookeeper, a reptile zookeeper, uh, but a zookeeper nonetheless. And she, whenever she would throw paper, she had what I would call tiger claw. And with tiger claw, you know, you do the one, two, three shoot, same as anybody else. But as soon as you begin that three, she would already start extending all of her fingers, like not even on the delivery, the approach at the very end, but on the way up, 
like a tiger trying to claw someone. And, you know, you could, you could read that. It wasn't a matter of me changing my throat last second. I had, you know, I had all the time in the world. I could hang out. I could run, get a coffee. I could you know, <laughs> read a book. I had, you know, all the time while, while she was busy giving me that tiger claw mm. and you know, I'd have the scissors ready to go. So that was a real obvious one there. What, the one thing that makes scissors different is it's the only throw where you retract some of the fingers and extend the others. Uh, rock has all five fingers retracted. Paper has all five fingers extended. So with scissors, it's the only one where you're putting those two fingers out. And you don't want to be too slow with that. So that develops most people to develop, use what we call spring-loaded scissors, where you drop the thumb down over the index and middle fingers and just shoot them out last second. But that in and of itself you know, can become a very easy tell uh, for a lot of people to read if they see you drop that thumb down to, to, deliver, to deliver the throw. And another thing, too, is, and this is something that I, I noticed after my first, uh, one of my first big tournament weekends at the World Championships in Toronto. I was doing matches, demonstration matches, uh, media matches, personal matches, money matches, left and right. By the end of the second day, my whole forearm was in pain. And literally every time I would try to throw scissors, especially just the, el the area right on the outside by the elbow would be in agony just because I wasn't used to wasn't used to throwing it hundreds and hundreds of times in, a, in the course of a day. Mm. So, uh, and then of course, you know, once I started feeling that soreness, I started not throwing scissors as much. I started mm -hmm. throwing paper and rock more just because they didn't hurt. And needless to say, going into the tournaments after that, we spent, you know, a good, at least, you know, 30 to 40 days, uh, incorporating that into my training of just getting in, you know, 50 or 60 throws a day just to get the sort of the long-term conditioning down. It's like tennis elbow or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Primer's elbow is what we called it. Uh, <laughs> primer's. And primer's, yeah, because when you're priming, the, the, the prime is the one, two, three uh, uh, shoot I part see. of it. So we call it primer's elbow. But uh. for me, it was more like a, a, a scissor arm uh, you know, or, or scissor hand, some people would call it. Uh -huh. But it really, for me, for me, it tended to strike more in the, the lower part of the arm. And it's it's no joke. It's painful. That's you know, what makes me you know, tell people, if you don't believe rock, paper, scissors is a sport, you know, play me in a <laughs> yeah. best of a thousand and we'll see who's talk, crying at the end. Talk to the doctors. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Down the line, I think we could do another interview because I feel like we could have a whole other talk sometime about just the patterns. You know, we've talked about more about the behavior stuff and influencing, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's so much to say about, you know, noticing what people are prone to in terms of patterns. So maybe down the line, we'll do that again. For now, let's, if you could talk a little bit about kind of dirty tricks, like say, obviously you wouldn't do these in a competitive setting or, or competition, but I was thinking like, if you were in like a you know, if you were a hustler in a, uh, you know, hustling people at this game, going bar to bar, just trying to make money, what are some tricks you can do to like, can you like throw your thing out really last minute to fool them or, or something like that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. And the, the thing is, there are what we call dirty tricks in the sport. Uh, you know, things that most of the top players <laughs> don't admit to using at the very least, but a lot of those same players when they were, you know, first coming up in the sport and they had just lost big at a tournament, they're out of money at the bus stop trying to get money for a ticket home. Uh, you know, they're going to be employing some of those dirty tricks because mm -hmm. they, they, they have to do it you know, to get home. So these are things like, and I know these are ones that you've mentioned to me as well, where like, you know, one dirty trick is changing your throw at the last minute. So, you know, let's say one, two, three, shoot. And you see that the other person you know, has thrown paper for instance, and then you, you put in scissors at the last second. Uh, you can try to get away with that. Again, that's a very low kind of play. In my personal experience, there's not a huge edge on that, but maybe that's just because of the type of player that I am. But even amongst the top players, you have to know these dirty tricks just so they don't get used against you at some right. point. Defense, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the best defense is knowing in this case. And in, uh, in a lot of the top tournaments, you will have a referee there whose role is kind of like the referee in a sumo match. You know, they're, they're the third individual at the dance. And they're there to watch for those last minute throws. Uh, you've got, you know, some of the some of the great tournament referees like uh, Brad Fox uh, out of Toronto, the head referee of the World Championships. Try pulling any of that stuff in one of his arenas and see how far it gets you. But again, if you're playing things like, you know, there's the last minute throw, and then of course uh, there's there's one that you mentioned to me, which is where you 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 play someone, and if they win, you put your hand up and go, oh, it's you know everybody knows it's the best two out of three. <laughs> um, Against a, a certain type of player, both of those strategies will work. That type of player uh, are what we call drunks. Uh, so a lot of the times if people are intoxicated, they're not paying attention. So you can do that last minute throw because they've, they've had a little bit too much and they're a little easier to, to take advantage of in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, they're not paying attention. Or you can do that best two out of three, just again, because they're not paying attention. You can do the same with someone when they're tired, you know, if it's the end of a long work night. It's anything that's going to be where, where the person's not in their element. Let's, let's say you've got a player like 
the greatest Australian player of all time, uh, uh, Clayton Dwyer, who's known as uh, Custard Chuck. That was his competitive name. <laughs> you know, you knew that when you saw him, it was great to see him, but you also know he was just getting off a 20-hour uh, a flight and was not going to be on top of his game and that his sleep schedule was going to be kind of screwed up for the next couple of days. So, you know, invariably, a player like uh, Clayton has a couple of plans in place to counteract that. And I'm not going to give away all of his, his <laughs> secrets, certainly, at this point. But but yeah, for sure, you will you will find that in terms of that those low types of play, Again, they're they're mostly dead ends. Uh, they're good to know just so you know when they're being used against you. Personally, I find a lot of the things like influencing players and uh, reading their tells and knowing just general patterns. I, I view for me, it's been a much more profitable path because again, those things like the last minute switch on someone, that's something you're only going to be able to get away with once. And right. if if you have a certain very meek sort of player who's not going to challenge you on it, they're still they're not going to play you again. Whereas mm -hmm. a lot of the strategies that I use, you know, like reading auras on someone, I can keep doing that over and over again. Th there's there's certain patterns you can read over and over. You can keep going back to the well as many times as you want. Yeah, you're you're developing real skills, not cheap things that you can only use a couple times. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and a lot of the players will not respect you for using those types of throws because we 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 like to think we're capable of much better than that. What about how, how much gambling goes on? I'm I'm curious, like you know, when you go to these competitions, is are there is there a lot of betting before and after the competitions, or how does that work? Well, realizing that uh, there are many younger players in the sport, uh, and I, I don't wish to 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 advocate what some may see as a questionable lifestyle. Uh, I you know, on one level, I don't wish to uh, speak to potentially illegal activities at some of mm. these events, but but I can say instead of um, Instead of saying gambling on the outcome, I will say that uh, many, many players have uh, looked to me for some personal tuition, and they've been more than happy to pay that tuition in terms of uh, receiving some valuable lessons uh, in, in exchange for their hard-earned money. So what I can say, though, is that um, most of the, the gambling, quote-unquote, that you see is mostly going to be amongst professionals. And when you're playing the top other players in the sport, nobody's really going that far up or that far low on each other. People are trying out their new strategy. So, you know, let's say if I'm going up against a player like the Saint who comes in from New Jersey, I haven't seen him in a year. He's going to be showing off some of his top new strategies. He's going to be sort of working on, uh, you know, rounding off some of the, the rough edges. And, and we understand that. So it, it's not like you're going to be, you know, it's, it's not like you're going to be putting your, your right. the real money on stakes like that. With small and, edges, and, especially. Yeah. Right, for sure. And uh, part of the appeal of the lifestyle of being a rock, paper, scissors professional is this sort of shady cd con man uh con artist i should say uh you know smoky back room sort of environment you know hustling with the other hustlers getting one over on the house that sort of thing uh, you're thinking like movies like the sting with uh with newman and redford all these classic old con artist things that's mm -hmm. part of the appeal of the sport for sure mm -hmm. so a lot of these players are trying to get over on each other the world rock paper scissors society saw that and you know they didn't want, want their tournaments to be turned into you know illegal casinos more or less so they introduced what's called street rps where if you started a tournament, you would be entered into the tournament and you'd also get, say, 10 street bucks, basically like Monopoly money, which you can then steal from other players. You can play with other players and whoever has the most of that money at the end of the night gets, you know, gets their own street prize. Uh. Um, and there was uh, uh, one player who went, who's, whose name is uh, Giannis, Y-A-N-I-S, who won the street tournament two years in a row, two years running, which is uh, tremendous. Like, I know he's the, the best street player of all time, uh, a better street player than I am, as a matter of fact. But he's hustling. He's hustling, right. Yeah. But what a lot of the things that were found, because one of the big questions when you look at these events and some of these events, you know, you'd, you'd be, the winner would get, you know, 10 grand, 50 grand, something like that. People would say, well, you know, why do the amateurs, why do the amateurs make it to the finals instead of just, why isn't it just the people that you say are the best professionals in the world? Why aren't the top players always in the top three or <laughs> right. four? It's like poker. And, and, yeah. yeah, and that's and that's a very good, yeah, exactly, much like poker. And that's a very good question. Uh, you will see some of the top players eventually win, like, you um, Sean Sears uh, was one of the great players who won uh, one of the great national tournaments in the U.S. What was happening in a lot of these large events is it, it kind of I mentioned The Sting earlier, which is a, a great movie I would recommend for anyone interested in that sort of con artist lifestyle to see. The top players realized that there was more money to be made outside the tournament than inside the tournament. Uh, or in many cases, at the very least, it would be a surer path to a little less money. So let's say you had a one in 128 chance at getting 10 grand, or you had probably a 60% chance of making, we'll call it five to eight grand on the average. Most people would probably go for that lower average. So you would, what you would find is players like C. Urbanis from Philadelphia and you know, Clayton Dwyer who would travel from Australia to Toronto and be out in the first round uh, like every year. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the top players in the world. 
how is that? But in the end, he was uh, he was making all of his money on side matches at the event. He was you know, he was playing right. street tournaments, and he was also you know he's also conducting some private seminars, shall we right. say, along the way. Right. It's a lot like the World Series of Poker and and those kind of tournaments where you know a, a lot of the reason people poker players want to go to those things is the you know the cash games that go on they're not the tournaments they might not even play the tournaments but the, these these things attract a lot of people that want to want to gamble and want to play the the cash game so i'm sure it's kind of a similar uh, atmosphere where you could yeah you could get into some you know some some lucrative spots without ever even entering the competition sure absolutely uh you know and and again a lot of these um events were run kind of like the big house in, in classic con artist terms where, where all the players were kind of in on it. And I'm not saying that these matches were fixed, you know, cause they certainly weren't uh, at all, but you know, we'd say there was the first uh, world championship in Toronto uh, master Pete Lovering, again, one of the great players of all time won that tournament. And, you know, of course he did, but there's a lot of talk where people were saying, okay, let's let Pete win this one, you know, like they could have stopped him. But at the same time, you know, once he started heating up, uh, he had that glow and you knew he was going to go a long way. People had said, Oh, you know what? Instead of facing Pete in the finals, I'll go out early and make up all my money on the side. And, you know, uh, the, the thing is, if you're a good player in an event like that and you keep winning those money matches, you know, and your pockets are bulging by the end of the night, there, there's an old expression, which is uh, nobody wants to be the only person with money in a room full of broke crooks. You know, <laughs> so you, you don't want to make yourself too big of a target, <laughs> in, in other words. Uh, you want to be kind of like that NPR interview. You want to be, you know, you want to make your coin, but you want to be just subtle enough about it that you can go back to the well and that nobody's coming back looking for, for revenge in a, a less, you know, a less conflict free, free version than rock, paper, scissors. So uh, if you were going to go into a bar and try to uh, make money at this with someone in the bar, is there, are there like known approaches? Like how do you, how do you organically uh, get into a, a match with an amateur at a, at a bar kind of scenario? <laughs> Any tips for well, that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. The, the, uh, at the and a lot of this may have may have changed, um, un- unfortunately, recently. With uh, you know, a, a lot of the larger rock paper scissors tournaments are going to be on hold. You know, at the time that we're doing this recording, there are concerns, um, uh, you know, about uh, the, the coronavirus uh, spreading and you know, avoiding large gatherings of people, that sort of thing. So you're not going to have these large 500 player tournaments, at least for a little while, right now. Formerly, I would have said that the best way to go into a bar and make money with rock, paper, scissors is to get a promotion together, approach a local beer distributor or alcohol distributor, and you know, offer to put together a string of tournaments for them for a set amount of money. That's always been where the most money is to be made in the sport is is by people by promoting uh, people who are running events. You have people like uh, the Walker brothers, uh, uh, Douglas and Graham, uh, who hosted the World Championships of Rock Paper Scissors. They're both advertising guys. You know, they they both have a, a long history of uh, doing great work with promotion, great work with advertising, and uh, you know they're much better at doing that than they ever were as players. You know, I'll, t- I'll tell you that much. Um, you, know, you find that a lot. The the, the players are really horrible as promoters and the promoters aren't really that great as players. But in terms of just playing against someone uh, in a bar, like just randomly meeting someone, the best thing that you can have going for you is a good reputation. And by good reputation, I mean, you know, just to be known for me, it's like, I'm known as that guy, you know, the guy who has the rock, paper, scissors. So when people, you know, are introducing me, it's like, Oh, Jason is a, uh, they don't, they don't know me as master Rochambola at this point. They say, Oh, Jason's got a, you know, he's, he's a, a rock professional rock, paper, scissors player. And then nine times out of 10, the person's like, what, is there really a strategy for that? And you start asking all the top 10 questions almost like in a row. You know, is there really a strategy? Can you do this? Can you do that? Well, well, let's go ahead and play, da 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 So a lot of what I have are, you know, I won't go so, so far as to call them uh, managements or, or managers, but I have agents, uh, people who work for me who know these things. Um, like in, in the, the Seattle, Washington area, uh, I have a, a good friend and associate who's also named Jason, Jason Middleton, who has acted as an agent for me. In any match that he sets up for me that I win, he gets 10% of those of those funds. <laughs> um, so, And I realize that's not, when you ask, I'm sure you're asking for like a hands-on strategy. Like, okay, what do you do as a strategy? How do you approach this person? How do you do your reads? Because that's the subject of your, uh, you know, of your podcast. But at the same time, to answer you truthfully, you know, A, the best thing to do is to either be promoting a, a large event if you want to make money with rock, paper, scissors, or have other people who are promoting you just enough to get your foot in the door because if you if you just randomly introduce yourself to someone it's like hi my name is you so and so i'm a professional rock paper scissors player they're just going to assume that you're some kind of low life or some kind of creep which you know most of the professional rock paper scissors players that i know have that at least as a part of their persona but you know you're not going to get your foot in the door that way it's you know, to give people just enough to make them interested but not enough to push them away at first and that's that's kind of a tough line 
to walk. Mm-hmm. But you know, mm-hmm. but if I if I see someone is leaning that way to start the match, I'll, I'll start sizing them up. I'll I'll start you know looking at their physical tells. I'll notice if they seem nervous or confident. You know, I'll notice uh, verbal patterns. Uh, a lot of the, the one of the first things I'll do when I'm trying to read a person is to figure out if they're um, more more visual or more verbal or more tactile. So it kind of edges into the sort of the neurolinguistic programming approach. Like if you know if you're talking and the other person says, "Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I can see that." It's usually a sign that they're more visual. So that's a person that you want to start flashing things to, like flashing scissors or flashing rock just outside their field of vision so it influences them. Whereas if the person says, oh, I hear what you're saying, yeah, I, I hear you on that, they're more verbal. So that person is a little more susceptible to getting influenced verbally. The longer I've played, the more I've really gone less towards reading and more towards influencing because for me, it's been a more profitable path. But a lot of it for me is I have the reputation. So pe- people people assume that I'm better at reading. So of course, I'm going to go with uh, influencing to yeah, is the path of better resistance. I've read thoughts on that even in, in, in poker where, you, you know, you just by trying to, if you, for example, like if you want someone to fold when you're, when you're bluffing, you know, you could kind of say something with the word fold in it and might, you know, uh, might affect somebody unconsciously or, or else uh, even, you know, whispering the word fold or something like that. I've seen people talk about those kind of ideas. So it kind of reminded me of that. Sure. Or you can just mouth it or say, you know, or say a word like old that rhymes with mm-hmm. fold. Uh, and it's still just kind of you're you're playing for very, very small edges here. But, you know, right. at the same time, they add up. So if you're you know, if you get a good rock read on someone and then you say rock and then you do a couple of other things, you know, you can start this little you know, percentage here, two or three percent there. All of a sudden, you know, you're going to have a 60 or 60 or so percent chance of winning a throw. And that's great. You know, it's it's that's a great place to start. It's a great right. place to work from in little in, in a game of, of small edges. You're looking for any little boosts absolutely uh, so yeah speaking of uh, the coronavirus stuff as you pointed out um when we were texting earlier you said um, rock paper scissors is a good game for playing remotely you can play it across the street or through the window you know it's something to yeah, pass for the sure. time when you're quarantined or something for sure it's uh it's one of the the few uh especially few one-on-one sports that you can play while maintaining that six foot radius uh, or six foot distance that that uh, folks are suggesting these days, and uh, you know a lot of those other sports are, are paddle sports like pickleball or badminton or sports where people take turns like say pool or um, you know bowling or things like that. You know, sure there's going to be that six foot distance there, but if you look at other things like one on one basketball or you know that there's a current uh, uh, sumo tournament that's going on in Japan, sumo wrestling or, or any other sports like that. And, you know, and by sport I do mean a game with a physical component. Yeah, rock, paper, scissors is great for that because, you know, I can play rock, paper, scissors from 20 feet away from someone. I can play from someone across the street. You know, people are out of work. Uh, People have a lot more time on their hands. I'm not going to be down on the corner shooting dice on the sidewalk uh, to get my hustle on, you know, because everybody's handling those dice. And that's, you know, it's not as clean of an approach. And and you don't want to be, nobody wants to be the person passing out latex gloves at the at the the local corner dice game you know you don't you don't want to be that you don't want to be that person and uh i should say too you know if we descend into an apocalyptic scenario rock paper scissors can be good for peacefully negotiating uh conflicts in the in the post-apocalyptic world you know and uh that kind of thing so it can come in handy sure absolutely absolutely yeah. uh and, and again but a lot of it comes down to you know if when you're we we've always suggested to not use rock paper scissors in matters of, of life and death there, there's, there's many times there's other and better ways to, to go about it because, you know, otherwise the world is just going to end up being populated with only high level rock, paper, scissors players. And, uh, yeah. you know, as, as great as that sounds to me, you know, so uh, you know, it, it may not be as good for, for diversity, for diversity, uh, you know, if, you, if you'd call it like that. So, so yeah, if it does come down to that scenario, uh, you have to make sure that if you're playing a match of rock, paper, scissors against someone and they lose that they're not just going to you know, act like they won anyway and take whatever you're, you're arguing. Right. You know, if it's a, arguing over yeah. the last supply and if they lose, they, they, you know, they kill you, you know, something yeah. like make that. It, make it close. You got to make it look, uh, you know, best out of a, you know, 10 or something or whatever. Make it, make it look like you, they almost won and give them a little bit of respect like, that way. Right. And, and I think as a strategy, it would be best used if you're trying to, if you're dealing with uh, a peaceful negotiation with someone who is a known quantity and with whom you are expecting to have uh, future interactions going forward. So, you know, sort of a, a mutual a mutual reliance, uh, in other words, comes into play there. And instead of it being sort of a, an angry thing where one person walks away, the loser, and is looking for revenge, mm-hmm. you realize, okay, the next time I encounter them, you know, we're going we're gonna to be playing this game again. 
10 or 20 times uh, to, to, to settle disputes. And in the long run, it'll, it'll all work out. That's, that's what people think anyway. You know, but of course, they're not taking into account uh, the mastery of some individuals over the sport. Uh, but, uh, what, uh, one more question. You ever used your skills to throw a rock, paper, scissors match for those kind of reasons, like for the benefit of um, something in the future? You know, it's it's so funny. It's like you're psychic. I was uh, I was actually just getting ready to bring uh, to bring that up as a concept. There's a time for winning and a time for losing, and uh, a good rock paper scissors professional will know that. One of the great players of all time that I know I've mentioned before, Clayton Dwyer from Australia, uh, has said that you you have to master losing before you can master winning, and that, that's a deep statement. And I'll leave that to your to your listeners to to meditate on that one. But sure, there's a, a time and place for everything. Uh, one of the more common things you'll see in the world of rock paper scissors is that professionals are always happy to lose for free. Um, you know, they can do little, little fun matches every now and then. And, uh, you know, winning a media match is good because it generates, you know, more interest in the sport. It, it sort of increases your aura as a player and all those things are good. You know, there's a price on that. You have to know, you know, kind of what you're looking for, but at the same time, sure. If you, if you play and, uh, win every match, all of a sudden, everybody knows all your tricks. And, and you can also look at there's players. Uh, and I know I've mentioned earlier, uh, C Urbanus, uh, out of Philadelphia, has made uh, based his whole career on what's known as the Urbanus defense, which is where you intentionally lose the first throw in a match. So if you're playing a race to mm-hmm. five, you start off down 0-1 in order to work from a defensive position. And uh, you know, I'd say that roughly, I mean, that, that's such an influential strategy. I'd say roughly half the players uh, in tournament play use the Urbanus defense, whether they realize it or not. But sure, there, there's a time and place to to win and time and place to lose, and uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. And again, when you're dealing with the small edges, you have to, to you have to go with those things, and it, it's really hard, like because a lot of times, uh, if you're one of the best players in the world and you know that you can win these matches, it takes a lot of discipline to realize that okay, it's it's best for my long term strategy if I lose right now. It's hard to force yourself. It's hard to sometimes it's hard to force your hands to lose. Yeah, you know? so it's like mm-hmm. even if you're um, you know, your brain is trying to force you into that losing position. Your your hands will still almost rebel against you. Hmm. Um, and I'm I'm actually you know like looking forward more to the future of the sport. Uh, just you know, not just with the matters of winning or losing. Uh, look at sort of the next level things that are going on. Something that I'm looking into at this point. I recently read a book called uh, Other Minds about the uh, the evolution of cephalopod consciousness. And uh, one of the statements in the book was how uh, octopuses have about two thirds of their neurons in their tentacles. So about two thirds of their their neurons aren't even in their brain, which I found fascinating. It allows hmm. the tentacles some degree of independent action. So uh, one of the things that I've been looking into those procedures aren't aren't legal in the United States yet. Uh, I do know that there are currently some uh, some Russian physicians that are offering that uh, the ability to implant a neural net inside the uh, the throwing hands of uh, you know, in this case rock paper scissors athletes, allowing the hands some degree of independent thought of away from the central central mind and a lot of what that's going to do i mean that that's one way to get around to tell but at the same time you know i've got i've got my hands full facing other players and now my my hands are going to be acting independently of me as well i mean Uh, it'll be an interesting strategy but we'll we'll we'll, we'll see how it works and i'll I'll, I'll, you just you just put you just pulling my pulling my leg now huh (laughs) you know it's like you you could you can believe me or not okay well i'm I'm looking into yeah let let the let the audience form their own you know form their own opinions um, so yeah, I have a lot more questions for you. Actually, I had a whole list of questions, but, uh, and, and a lot of them were about thinking about the patterns people throw. And I think mm-hmm. maybe one day in the future, you know, we'll, we'll have another conversation, but I think this has been really awesome so far, uh, what we got today. And, uh, again, this has been Jason Simmons, AKA master Roshan Bola. If, if there's ways people want to get in touch with you, what's, what's a good way for that? <laughs> At this point, like a lot of other players in the sport, I'm keeping kind of a, um, a low profile, uh, but probably the most, um, some of the more recent work that I've done has been for uh, the Moxie Games. Uh, basically, they run an event called SkillCon that has everything from competitive juggling. Uh, they have Hedis, which is ping pong that you play with your head. There's a version of volleyball that you can only play with your feet using kicks. Speed Rubik's Cube solving, basically every sort of fringe sport imaginable. Uh, and I've worked with them a little bit. And actually, I had one of the more recent ones, uh, I uh, was involved with professional uh, poker player Perry Friedman, who a lot of your listeners will probably be familiar with. He and I played a couple of uh, grudge-based rock, paper, scissors matches. So that's going to air on ESPN. Uh, it's still being edited, so I'm not quite sure when the air date is. 
but yeah, it's it's some some truly interesting and great stuff uh, going on in terms of uh, fringe sports. And your your viewers are more than happy to check out. And if anybody wants a private match or a spiritual uh, you know, spiritual instruction, they can they can find me around if they look hard enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not I'm not that hard to find, especially uh, especially if you're on the professional RPS scene. Awesome. This has been very interesting. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with Zach Elwood. To learn more about my Poker Tells books, check out readingpokertells.com. Thanks for listening.